Here we go. Hello, everyone. It's Dr. Anna Kabeca here, and I am thrilled to be on with one of my dear friends, Dr. Mindy Pels. She is well known in the fasting space and has been a leader in, um, gosh, in fasting, in um, online, in the online space for many years. I mean, she's, uh, anyway, Mindy, how are you? <laughs> Thank you. I'm great. I, you know, I have to tell you that I, I think I've said this to you before, but you really are one of my favorite people. I just, it's such a joy to talk to you. I love talking hormones, but you make me feel better every time I see you. So thank you so much for having me and for this conversation. Oh my gosh, you're so awesome. No, I feel the same. And plus we're both our daughter, we have so much in common. Our daughters love horses. We yeah. got into this fasting journey. And yeah. I like, we've been in the fasting journey probably longer than most. I know you know, I, I've been fasting, but regularly the keto green lifestyle, which is the the angle that I incorporated, really started in 2014. And mm -hmm. we're in menopausal women, more and yep. more menopausal women. And so that was, you know, this has been part of, you know, definitely has been part of my journey. And so I want to um, check in with you, like, what are some things you've noticed in longtime fasters yeah. and longtime keto? Yeah. You know what? I think it's a really interesting point um, because I think you and I offer a really, a really unique. Whoop! I'm getting a little feedback there. Um, we we offer a really unique perspective because we have principles that we can look at science and go, oh, "Hey, this looks really cool," and then we get to test it on hundreds of thousands of women. And um, I don't know. There's not a lot of us that are using the principles of keto and fasting and timing them to a woman's hormones and understanding how the impact that's there. So um, I love I, I, I love hearing your thoughts on it as well. Um, uh, to answer your question, uh, in long term fasting, to me, long term is anything over 24 hours. But I think most people would think a long term is like a three day water fast. Um, I am a huge advocate for these longer fasts to dip into them periodically. I'm not a fan of them doing them all the time, especially for women, but I really fought hard in this new book for six different length fasts because I think we talk so much about intermittent fasting and we don't give enough credit to something like a 36 hour fast. We're watching it unstick a lot of weight, especially for women. 48 hour fast. I see a lot of evidence that you are rebooting dopamine receptor sites. And, you know, if you really want to heal the body, you get to know yourself in a 72 hour fast. So I, I love the longer fast that for women, they just have to be timed to a woman's cycle if she still has it. And I, and I think we shouldn't fear it. I think we should use it as a healing tool. Yeah. And I want to talk about the different, the different lengths of fasting. And you have your new book coming out December 28th. Fast like a girl, fast like a girl. And I, and I love that because you talk about cycling, you know, fasting at different phases of your cycle and when's the best time, when's not. And I want to think that, you know, a couple of the things that I've definitely seen in is like fasting and carb restriction for too long, causing weight gain and rebound. And you've seen that as well. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 But, you know, here's what's interesting is I feel like we are a culture of absolutes. And so we're always searching for the one answer. So now you probably saw this as well is that we went, oh, low carbs, not good for women. So no women, sh women shouldn't do it. And that's not true. There's a time where low carb is really going to serve a woman. And there's a time where it's really going to hurt her. And does she understand how to navigate those moments? So I, I, don't, I think you're probably in the same boat as me. I, I really get frustrated when the media comes out and says, no keto, no fasting for women, end of story. Yeah, um, that's ridiculous because that is by design, how we're designed yeah. to live, especially through menopause and beyond postmenopausally, we have to, we yep. are by design, you know, have to, the issue is how are we breaking our fast? Yes. How often are we feasting? Yes. And, you know, are we watching our markers? Are we watching our inflammatory markers? Are we watching our hemoglobin A1C? Are we watching to see what's happening with our hormones as we do this? We should get a, re a revival. Yes. And if not, we have to say, okay, 
you know, maybe I've been too strict too long. It's just like, you know, you bring this up and I call it the chicken salad phenomena. Oh yeah. <laughs> I, mean, I haven't heard this. That's what I call it. You know, when you review a die diary and chicken salad is on there every day for lunch. <laughs> And you're like, that is no longer a health food. That is no longer a health food for you. But then, of course, there is the part that chicken has high in apple and lake acid. So you got to watch that amount anyway. But still, if you're eating the same thing, we talked about that regimen, so strict, you know, you have like we have horses and we put blinders on when we don't want them to be distracted. Mm. And it's like, OK, you can't see what else is there. I know in my book, Menu Pause, I was like five different menu plans. We have to break the mold. One includes a carb up plan. Yeah. And that is six days because day seven, you can feast or you can fast or whatever it may be. So talk about fast like a girl. And I want to go through some of the journey that you've been on in creating in creating this because there's no bigger fasting group than you have with your resetter podcast, your resetter group. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, you know what? The chickens, my my version of the chicken salad is oatmeal. Every but why does everybody have oatmeal for breakfast? I'm, yeah. I'm like, what? I I mean, I like oatmeal, but somehow they marketed to us that oatmeal was an amazing thing to have for breakfast. So yeah, totally yeah it's really it. good for livestock. However, <laughs> <laughs> that should tell you something, that right? Tell you, but it's also a winter grain. So there's time mm -hmm. like you need those more, you know, those winter grain, like those, you know, if you're going to eat any grains, I mean, like gluten free oats may be an option. But yeah. um, yeah, they're... yeah, yeah, that's so funny. So and and I love the horse analogy too because we totally get horses together. I thought that was great. Um, to answer your question, here's what I saw and how even fast like a girl came about was when I first went to YouTube to educate people about fasting. Um, Jason Fung's book had just come out, The Obesity Code, and everybody was so whoop. Did you lose me? Everybody was so excited about that. They were like, this is amazing. And so men and women dove in to his principles. And they're what I call the O matters, where they were like one meal a day. Um, that's all I'm eating. And so what ended up happening was that we started to see that these people hit a stuck point. And what happened was all the weight they lost, they stopped they stopped losing it, but they were still doing one meal a day. They didn't vary it enough. So that was my first at that point on YouTube. I was like, well, gosh, we're seeing, we're seeing these people stuck. But in my clinic, what I was doing was teaching fasting variation. So I started to teach variation, uh, starting with something called a 5-1-1, where five days a week you do intermittent fasting, one day a week you stretch your fast, and one day a week you don't. And I started to see that that style of fasting was actually helping women even more than men. And when I looked at, I, I then went, okay, well, what if we time the variation of fasting and keto to a woman's hormones? And how can we look at like the three major sex hormones and get to know what they, what kind of lifestyle they want? And so that was sort of the birth. Of, and this was about seven years ago of what I now call the fasting cycle which is a, a key that women can use to time different length fast to different hormones. And we, we can go through that in a moment. Um, and when a woman knew when to fast and when to do keto and when to step out, we saw that she got all the same results that Jason was talking about in his book. Um, but she was, she never got stuck and her hormones never tanked. So it really became clear. And now, honestly, I mean, you go to my YouTube channel and it's crazy how many people, how many women are like, yep, this is working for me. Yep, this is working for me. So that's really the premise of Fast Like a Girl is teaching women how to do it differently. And how to flex, right? How to you flex. have to yeah. flex. That flexibility is important. And I definitely got caught into that. And again, I always say if it, if it you know, like I am like my best and worst student. So, but I was, you know, trying different recipes for menu pause and I was doing a carnivore and carnivore was in you know increasing my weight and I was like okay this is no carbs I'm in ketosis I don't get it and then you know think about leptin resistant we become more leptin resistant possibly when we're doing this extended fasting so that was interesting to me and then also when you're doing keto for a long time 
you are um, not hungry, so you're naturally inclined to have longer fast and not eat as much. And yeah. that, again, can cause that weight loss resistance, that weight gain. So I always think, how do I keep the mitochondria healthy? How do yeah. I increase? Like, so the mitochondria is the powerhouse of our cells. It's where we produce energy. And if you're feeling sluggish, you should, when you're fasting and when you're getting keto green, when you're following Dr. Mindy's program, you should have high energy. And when you're feeling sluggish, we have to think, okay, what's going on? Detox pathways, mitochondrial pathways. And these are some things that we really need to look at. And Great. so you have to like, you have to keep the flexibility is the only way I can see there are seasons for a reason. So just like in our daily life, we have to, we have to make these changes. Yep. And especially as we go through you know, perimenopause, menopause, yeah. Yeah. I couldn't agree more. And, um, I think, you know, one of the things I don't, I'm curious what your energy is like. I know you're, you've, you're, you're nursing your body's, um, doing a good thing with whatever it's got going on cold wise, but, um, my energy doing it this way, like I actually struggle at the end of the day to calm myself down. I have too much energy and I, I, you don't have that. I'm like, I literally have a whole like plan that I do at the end of the day to try to get my, my body to go into more of a parasympathetic. It's, it's crazy. And I think a lot of it is because I know when to access ketones and I know when not to, I've been practicing these principles so long now. And a, a new thing that I've been saying, I'd be curious, um, you know, how you feel on this, but I think if we look at a woman's menstrual cycle, when hormones go high, when during ovulation in the week before our period, that's when things have to change. And each one of those sections have to be a little different. And so when we look at ovulation, when we've got estrogen at her peak, testosterone at its peak, and a little bit of progesterone, we fasting's okay, but we don't want to go super long into a fast because you still don't want to raise cortisol because progesterone's there. And then at the, the week before our cycle, starts, okay, we know when cortisol goes high, progesterone becomes shy. She doesn't come out. And so we've got to have a whole different approach during that week before our cycle. And it's not just fasting. It's not just food. It's social engagements. It's exercise. It's those of us that are rushing women. It's how hard we push ourselves. So I, I, I feel like the concepts around hormones high, hormones low in a 30 day period is something that we should have learned at 13. I don't know why we didn't learn it when our period started. And it's something that we need to take into consideration at 25, 35, and it's massively different at 45. And there's just a big hormone illiteracy problem. Women don't understand their hormones and, and doctors don't talk about hormones. And it's really causing us more damage than, than good. Yeah. And I think, again, it's like, it's just playtime. Like, I think we have to learn to understand our body and be willing to change it up, right? Mm -hmm. Like what works yeah. for a while then stops working. So if yeah. we keep the flexibility, it's definitely something, you know, I've, I've dealt with and I've seen too in my online community. It's, it's that flexibility. And I would say that, you know, it's interesting for different body types, like the, like me, the, you could call it the survivor genes or the warrior genes, which is I like to do versus PCOS genetics, right? <laughs> Those of us with PCOS genetics that go through perimenopause, menopause can gain much more weight, mm -hmm. can have much more problems with adult acne, can mm -hmm. have, you know, I mean, these are, it's interesting. So versus if I'm, you know, significantly estrogen deficient versus estrogen dominant. So I think there's things to look at and play with as we're going through menopause and beyond. And that whole perimenopausal cycle as well, because you think when progesterone's high, we naturally become more insulin resistant. So mm -hmm. we want to conserve glucose. So you yeah. would say, okay, that's your time to carb up, but it may also be a time to fast. Mm. As to long as it doesn't heavy. increase. Yeah. As long as it doesn't increase cortisol. Right. So, so there are some modifications to that when progesterone goes high. So I, I think I love this idea that the body is so intelligent that it makes you more insulin resistant when progesterone comes in because it needs more glucose to make more progesterone. 
let's just stop with that miracle for a moment. How many times have we sat on the couch the week before our period, eating a tub of, of ice cream and, and a bunch of pizza and, and berated ourselves like, or bitched about it, but your hormones were telling you, Hey, chill out, bring glucose up. You, you're going to be, you're, you, I need, I need that from you to be able to make an appearance. So I love that idea. Now, where does fasting fit into that? If you are fat adapted and you have, have a good metabolic flexibility rhythm and you're able to fast pretty effortlessly, then you might be okay getting away with a smaller fast the week before your period, because it won't be a shock to your body. Your body's not going to raise cortisol to the same degree as it would in a new faster. The challenge, and you mentioned this before, is that when we fast and we go into ketosis, we stop becoming hungry. And so you got to make sure once you open up your eating window that you eat, make sure you're eating. And, it, and, it, and sometimes that might be eating even when you're not hungry to make sure that you're giving progesterone what she needs. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And I like that, that awareness, right? Because that we haven't had that awareness in women's health and hormones yeah. and the flexibility and flexing, which I, I love that you've come up with this. So talk about your book, The Fast Like a Girl. And, you know, what is within those pages? Oh, my God, a lot of a lot of blood, sweat and tears, as, as you know. Um, you know, okay, so it's split into three sections. Um, the first section might be what I'm the most proud of, and I actually think is really good for men. When I when I read it, the audio book, the sound engineers at the time, uh, or that were in the studio with both men, they were like, this is fascinating. This is a good book for men. So it's the science of fasting. So I talk um, uh, in the first couple of chapters, I talk about why diets don't work. I think this is really important. I have what I call the, the failed five things that women do when they diet. So I feel like before we start the conversation of like, what do you need to do with fasting? I want to make sure you understand what you need to not do when it comes to food and fasting. So that's the first chapter. Uh, chapter. But then I dive into six different length fasts. I gave them all fun names just so we remember what they are. And I feel like we should all have fun with um, health anyways. And I go into the science of them and why you would want to do them. I then go into metabolic switching. I talk about how it's the in and out of sugar burner, fat burner. That's so important for weight loss. And then I go into women's hormones. And, um, and the second section is all about women's hormones. And it's all about how do we take food and fasting and time it to our hormones depending, you know, it's a lot on the cycling women. And yes, we've got the perimenopausal woman who's probably the hardest of all, of all to help. Um, and we can chat about that. Um, and then we've got the postmenopausal women. And then the last section is really all of the, um, you know, all the application. I have a 30 day reset in there that women can do. I have recipes. I, you know what I did in this book that was so needed in a fasting book for both men and women is I have a whole chapter on breaking your fast. That oh, I let's talk about that. Yeah. Yes, Cause I think that's really, really important in, I mean, we look at, um, you know, we look at keto, we look at metabolic health, we look at gluten free, and we look at the foods that we're substituting versus the foods we're incorporating to improve our, you know, metabolism, the bacteria within us to keep them sustainable and resilient and keep inflammation down. So there's been some interesting research that has looked at this, um, like, for example, gluten free, you know, gluten free diet, and if they're substituting gluten free crap, instead of good whole foods yeah. and a variety of greens and um, that they get actually an increased risk of heart of heart attack heart events mm -hmm. in the first year of going gluten free well it's because we haven't used the fermented foods or the greens or the fiber and we're giving it other you know not so good substitutes so i think it's really yeah. you know really valuable to look at that so i, I want to talk about that a little bit mindy yeah, I, you know, so here's the, there's two ways to look at breaking the fast. 
Um, first is let's look at what's happening while you're fasting. And there are two major things that are going on on most fasts. But, you know, again, it, the, the hours of the fast matter. But the two major things is that you're dipping into autophagy, which is the body repairing itself and breaking. Its, I, I think of autophagy as like catabolic, like it's breaking down the bad. Um, and so when you bring food back in, we need to stimulate mTOR so we can build muscle. And as you know, and, and I know, as you go through menopause, you got to fight for that muscle. So we don't want you to lose the, that muscle strength and the muscle building component of this. So one of the keys to breaking a fast is moving from autophagy into mTOR. This is why in the book, I really emphasize how important protein is, breaking your fast with protein, 30 grams of protein. I'm a, I'm a big believer that if you hit that 30 grams, you start to trigger amino acid receptors, you can build muscle, super important. Second, second thing that most people are not aware of is that when you're fasting, you're changing your whole microbiome in your gut. And when we look at some of the, cr the critics of fasting, there, they, there's a lot of people, mostly men out there that are saying, um, you know, it, it's bad for the microbiome. Well, what it's doing is you're breaking down the old and you're bringing back the new and you're creating a new environment. It'd be like if I came to your garden and I got all the weeds out of it. Now, how great your garden grows is going to be based off of what plants you, you put in there. So it's the same thing with fasting. This is where like your keto green and the menu pause are so powerful because when we come back into food, another big thing is to come back into what I call the three Ps, polyphenol, probiotic, prebiotic foods. And then the third way that I recommend breaking a fast is if you want to elongate the fast or you're one of those people that you have that boomerang effect with fasting where you're like, I'm really good fasting. And then I go in, you know, I eat and I'm like, oh my God, I eat too much. You're going to want to add more fat into your diet so that you stabilize that blood sugar and you don't, you don't go into this massive hunger mode. So I think we got to do one of those three things, uh, some, and, and you can do all three, but that first meal is really important because it's your entry back into these healing effects like mTOR, um, really, and stabilizing your blood sugar. You can kill that hunger hormone so that you don't just start eating for hours and hours. Give us an example of what a meal looks like breaking a fast, your ideal break fast. Oh, you know what my favorite meal to break a fast with is um, half of an avocado. Uh, sometimes it's a whole avocado. Sauerkraut. I, I put a ton of sauerkraut and hemp seeds. So the, if I'm not doing meat and I'm just doing, uh, you know, just more of like probiotic, prebiotic, that's one of my favorite. The My go-to lately, because I'm really working on building muscle, has been some grass-fed sausage and with some sauerkraut. I'll put those two together. We eat a lot of sauerkraut in our house. Uh, I can't say I always love it, but I always eat it. Oh, and, and kimchi is another one. I got to show you this real quick because my daughter brought me this because it's a busy working day. So oh you guys gosh. can't see it if you're listening. But Looks it's so avocado good. with za'atar, which is thyme. It's like some salsa. So that's awesome. On a bed of arugula, um, broccoli sprouts and grass-fed sausage and eggs with turmeric. So, oh, my God. Amazing. Right? Amazing. Like, oh so, my gosh. So it's actually, if, waiting for me. if we, you can go ahead and eat it. Go ahead. Eat. I feel <laughs> like you should eat it. Like it's there in front of you. How are you going to wait? But let's break down that meal. So the avocado, we're not only giving the great omegas, but we're also helping to stabilize blood sugar. The, I love the microgreens. What I try to do with the microgreens is I, sometimes I'll do the broccoli sprouts. Sometimes I'll do the sunflower um, sprouts. Like I try to get a diversity in there. Arugula is my new favorite go-to because of the liver and, and how it's a bitter for the liver. Um, and then, you know, I believe like you that like women need some carbs. So you add in some of that risotto is that's amazing. Turmeric's going to bring inflammation down. You've got the grass fed sausage to stimulate mTOR like bravo, my friend. That was, that was like a perfect meal put together. You got me hungry now. Oh yeah. So good. There's no risotto, but there's the salsa. Oh. But that sounds like a good ad. Oh, was it risotto? I thought, what was the, it looked like, uh, uh, was there a grain in there? Like a, a gluten-free grain? Uh, no, it's just the sprouts and the veggies. Oh, okay. It's all stir fried together. 
Oh. And so it's the eggs with the sausage stir fried together. Ah, yes. And oh, eggs. Okay. Eggs, eggs. Oh, yeah, that's yeah. eggs. So eggs and look like, yeah. The perfect. risotto. And then the za'atar, which is thyme and sesame seeds, Amazing. which is on sprinkled on everything with, yeah. So now my, one of my questions to you is, will you stay in ketosis with that meal? Because it's pretty, it's a pretty keto green friendly meal. Yeah. Yeah. Typically. Yes. Yeah. If I was in ketosis right now. I'd probably stay in ketosis. Right. Right. <laughs> but I am not. Yeah. So. But, but that's a really, really good point. Like I, I, if I have a long day of work, I'll try to stay in a fast if it's appropriate for my hormones at the time, as long as I can. And then if I'm going to eat, I think about what I'm going to eat because if I go too into the carbs, um, then I'm going to be sleepy and my brain's not going to work right. right. So, yeah. so that, yeah, I'm, I wish that we lived closer. I'd come over and share the meal with you. Oh, I would, I would be happy to share it with you. <laughs> <laughs> and I think this is a really important point. Like I found that breaking and, and tell me what you think about snacking and, um, and, you know, eating during the feast, you know, the feasting window versus the fasting window. Um, also, you know, one of the things that I recognize in my own life, if I wait, like now it's almost one o'clock, if I wait till after 10, 11 o'clock, my metabolism is slower. Like it works mm. great for me to eat by five or 6 p.m. and break fast by 10 or 11 a.m. Yeah. And otherwise I, I'm challenged the one meal a day that was tough for a while. I think it's mm -hmm. that I do think, and then we're going to start picking up more as their research gets into fasting and women, but the genetic phenotypes that do better mm -hmm. longer and when you need, but again, the flexibility evens the playing field. Right. Right. The best diet. I heard this recently. I was like, this is amazing. The best diet is the one you can follow. Yeah. Um, and you know, like you can, we can look at all our genetics, we can look at all our hormones, but when we're talking eating windows, what's the one you can actually succeed right. at? So like for me, before I became an empty nester, I have no children in my house now. It's a whole new world. Um, but when I had kids, I wanted to eat dinner with, with, you know, when my kids were home, my kids were still, I still have kids. Um, but yeah, when my, no, absolutely. Right. Yeah. Family. Yeah. You want to eat the family dinner, but that meant I would stop eating at eight. So I had to eat, you know, push breakfast back. But now we're actually trying to eat dinner a little earlier, minding the light and the melatonin. So we're trying to get dinner done by five, which is a totally different experience for us, which means I can open up my window a little bit earlier in the morning. So I, th I think we look at the window, like what is the best window for you to succeed? And then put that in, in your day and get that established. And then you can build fasting around that. Yeah, no, I love that. I love that. You know, one of the questions, and we did this in our fasting masterclass that we had with you, me, Cynthia Thurlow, and Dave Asprey. That was a great masterclass. That was good. One of the things, like, talk about breaking your fast with um, coffee, with teas, with, I mean, and when are we, what are things allowed? Let's say it this way what are things allowed in this fasting window? Yeah, you found to make success for people. Yeah, so I have in the book something that I've really been highlighting, and I think we don't talk about it enough. It's called a fasted snack, and I've actually seen it. Dave actually a couple of years ago really got me thinking about it um, because he's such a fan of the butter. And then I don't. You've heard him talk about the smoothie he makes, where he puts coffee and MCT oil and fiber in there, and he feels like you're staying in a fasted state. So. I really wanted to look into the science and the science is showing that if we bring in like a fat bomb, a pure fat bomb, it, what it does is it allows people to fast longer. They can get the benefits of a longer fast. Um, it won't pull them out of ketosis, but it kills that hunger hormone. So it, it's really good for beginner fasts, fasters. So in the new book, I have a whole list of my favorite fasted snacks that we're seeing work. Um, we have been, I've seen, uh, avocados. I've seen bone broth. I've done bone broth with people before, especially when they are first starting. Um, they'll use lean into bone broth to get, help them get to those longer periods. So a uh, keto cups, I'm a huge fan of keto cups. I wish I could make them in my own home. Um, but any kind of fat bomb that's a hundred percent or, you know, 90% fat with maybe a little bit of protein, um, is going to do well, but it needs to be mostly fat. Yeah, no, I agree. I agree. Typically, again, 
what do what you need to do like even ketone elixirs like there's the kinetic like you know in the glass bottle which is really nice liquid ketones to help you if you need to during that time to extend your fasting especially as you're exercising fasting but now mindy when we go to a five day you know if we extend a lot of people say in the research okay three days is gosh you're just getting all the benefits why stop at three days yeah yeah, you know, how question. long can we go and how long is too long? Yeah. Oh, for this is such, for women. For women. Yeah. This is such a good question. So I'm a huge fan of the three day water fast. In fact, uh, when the book comes out the first week of January, we're doing a worldwide three day water fast in conjunction with Hay House. And um, it's going to be really fun. So if you if your community wants to jo join in, it's a it's a free service that I'm doing for the world. So um, so I love the three day water fast. I feel my best um, physically. And this is me as a 53 year old. God only knows perimenopause, menopause. I don't know where I am. I, I, I was 166 days, Anna, without a period. I'm like, let's do this. Let's go. And then it just sneaks right back and on. And then you. it came in and I was like, Phew. Come on, I'm back at it again. So I know that was me at 56. I am now finally menopausal. Postmenopausal. But, but I think that's so good. The yeah. later we go into menopause, the better. Well, ovarian function is a marker of longevity. Oh. So the I longer we that. can maintain healthy ovarian function, and if we can reignite healthy ovarian function, that is a marker of longevity. Oh. So being able to do this and with what you teach, what I teach, it is powerful for that restoration, right? We're 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 utilizing our body's energy initially to destroy the cells that are sucking us, mm. our energy away from it, resources mm. away from healing and repair. So we do that and that improves, improves our energy. And then what we've also seen in the keto green uh, world too, is, is just that getting into ketosis, creating more insulin sensitivity improves ovarian function. Again, we have to do it in the right way. We have to support the gut microbiome. And for me, that's with the microgreens, the greens, the fermented foods, and adding those in, cycling those in. Agreed. Agreed. Yeah. It, excellent point. And so on the three-day water fast, what I would say is if you time it right to your cycle, which would be when hormones are low, if you're if you're a cycling woman, um, if you're menopo post-menopausal, you can really put it in anywhere. Um, you're right at three days, stem cells are kicking in. So you get to decide, think of it like a switch. Once that those stem cells come in, you get to decide how long do you want them there? So the way that I've approached it is sometimes I just want to get rid of the old senescent cells that are just not serving me anymore. I just want to get, you know, in three days, we'll do that. I'll get some stem cells. I'll get rid of the old ones, slow aging down. That's what I'm going for. Um, but other times, like I had an Achilles tendon injury that I could not make go away. I tried everything. And so I threw a five day water fast on it at it. And what was really weird is on the fifth day, the Achilles started buzzing. It was almost like I could feel the stem cells going there and the pain went away. So then I started to re gently reintroduce food and it ne the pain never came back. It never, the Achilles tendon never was a problem again. Now, if I had stopped at three days, I might've not gotten that. So I had a very specific thing I was going for. I love that. And I think what's being ignited when you do those extended fasts in the same you know, on an accelerated level with dry fasting is you get into a piezoelectric charge. Mm -hmm. You get that strain, piezoelectric, electric. And it is, it is a word that came to me in the middle of a dry I fast. love this word. Tell I me. Know. I'm Look like geeking out. out. I know. Just think when, like, when there's tension on something, mm. like imagine fashion. I, I thought about this because exactly the same thing at the end of a three-day fast felt very, very light. Yes, a three you do. day dry pass, very, very light and, and airy. And I and it, this word came to me, piezoelectric. And so I looked it up and I'm like, uh, maybe I studied it at some point in medical school. I'm but sure it's that know. it's that that electric charge that comes when there's friction between two surfaces. And so whether it can be a tension, a friction caused by tension, so that drying, that cleaning, that separating, it can, you know, and so you can get this piezoelectric charge. But anyway, that buzzing that buzzing that is piezoelectricity 
I bet you. I mean, it's possible. It's so fascinating to me. That oh my gosh. This phenomenon is really, really fascinating. And so I mentioned dry fasting, not for the light of heart in our girlfriend doctor club and our community will do it. Like ideally, especially if there's issues getting up at night from mm. after, you know, after dinner, no more than a cup of tea or something, and then dry fast till the morning, you know, especially, you know, that's something to practice. But you've talked a bit about dry fasting as well. Yeah. You know, well, let me go back to the physioelectric. You always, okay. this is why I love talking to you. You, you know, you, you give me new insight and I had never, I, I, I too had studied that concept, but I think you're onto something because I couldn't quite figure out what the buzzing was. I'm like, am I thinking this? And it buzzed for weeks without any pain. It was really cool. So now thank you for that. Um, dry fasting, you know, it's a complicated one and it's been complicated to really be able to teach on a, on a public platform like YouTube. So, because we're a culture of, if something's really good, let me do a whole lot of it. And the research I've seen on dry fasting, 12 to 24 hours is a really good dry fast time. Um, you can safely do it. You know, Ramadan is a great example of this. People have been doing 12 hours dry fasting every day for a month, for years, religiously. So I believe we can, we can really use a 12 to 24 hour dry fast to accelerate healing. It's, I didn't put it in the book because it's really, um, it's really hard because a lot of people go longer. They go five days. I've had debates on, on YouTube where people are like, I'm 10 days into a dry fast. And we are, my team and I are like, no, like, unless you have a doctor that's watching you, we don't have any evidence that 10 days without food and water is, is going to help you. But to your point overnight to a 12 hour for a woman, yeah. I mean, you, it forces your body when you take water out of the equation, you force your body to go find other areas that it stored water and burn that. And one of the places it finds is fat. So it can be a better fat accelerator. You just need to be very strategic about it and cautious and not do it too long. Yeah, no, I put the definition, you know, that piezoelectric, electric charge that accumulates in certain solid materials such as crystals, certain ceramics, and biological matter okay. such as bone DNA and various I proteins. I love in it. Look at that. To, yeah, in response to applied mechanical stress. But I'm telling you, this is one of the things that, Mindy, like I said, this word came to me during a dry fast because I was experiencing this heightened floating energy, right? And um, But when we are fasting, I mean, that is where divine inspiration comes. We are closer to God. It's a spiritual phenomenon. There is no accident that fasting is part of every religious culture. We need to get rid of the brain fog. We need to you know, have, be able to discern what's working for us, what's not working for us. Yeah. And for me, it's whenever you know, I have a difficult decision to make or struggling with something, I need to fast and pray. And I think that's been an important part of why fasting is so important. I love that you talk about you talk about it and you teach people how to do it correctly. Yeah. Your books books are an excellent resource. Your prior book was the um, menopause, the menopause reset. reset. Yeah, menopause reset, amazing book, and now fast like a girl. And yeah, um, yeah I'm so happy to support you. And I'm yeah, gonna here fastlikeagirl.com forward slash pre order. The, uh, thank you. And I, and I want to, I want to make sure we don't lose sight of the spiritual piece of this, because I do think we don't talk about this enough. Um, and I know you talk about it in your community. I talk about it in mine. Like it, we, when life is getting hard, this is another reason to train yourself to fast. When you pull food out of the equation and you pray, uh, you tap into whatever your belief system is and you just quiet your mind the most insane answers will come to you. And I'll, and I'll share a really uh, heartfelt story that I actually have never shared publicly before. Um, I was going through a really difficult time with my daughter. You know what it's like to raise girls. <laughs> and um, I was really worried about her. She was off at college and some of the things she was doing was really scaring me. And um, I couldn't get through to her. I couldn't connect with her. I couldn't find a, a path in. 
And so I just decided I'm going to fast and I'm going to pray for the answer. And um, I went into a three day water fast and every day I just sat in meditation and was like, tell me what to do. Tell me what to do. And oh my God, I, I could cry on this on the third day. Um, I got the answer. Um, don't worry. I've got her. She's going to be okay. And, oh, oh, and, and do you know that like two months later she called and asked if she could come home. And I will tell you that was about three or four years ago, she is thriving. She is a farrier now. She's found this badass profession as a changing horseshoes. She found herself a mentor. She's doing it with another woman who is like these two badass women that are changing horseshoes and changing the farrier world. She has an incredible boyfriend that we are like in awe of what an ma incredible match he is. And she's living on her own, doing fantastic. If you had told me three years ago she would be here, I would have been like, no, I'm, I just want to make sure she stays alive. And, and it was in that third day that I just knew she was going to be okay. And I don't think I would have gotten that if I hadn't fasted. I, I love that you had that knowing. And with that knowing, how did that change your peace? Yeah, it, I just could let go. It was like the set, it was so clear. I, because the noise was gone, I just kept hearing, I've got her. I've got her. And I, it, you know, God, universe, I knew whatever somebody was talking to me saying, I've got her. Don't worry. I've got her. And when, when she called exactly. two months later and like sort of sheepishly asked if she was, could come home, I was like, thank you, God. Thank you for taking care of her so much. You were, you sent her home. And I, it changed the way I, I approached my relationship with her and perhaps me letting go and not gripping on to her allowed her the freedom to, to ask to come home. And she, I mean, ultimately it meant she didn't finish school, um, but she's now got this other great career and, the, and life she's created. I love that. I love that. I think one of the things that, you know, we learn as, as moms, like our you know, I've been through the crazy stage where you're making sure everyone else is okay. And, and, you know, I neglected my health or we neglect our own health. And it's when we can focus on that, that internal peace, right. And that, that improves the condition of everyone around us, our children. And, you know, and, and I've witnessed it in my own life too. When I'm frazzled and, and hectic, my kids are. Yeah. And when I'm at peace and present, my kids are. Yeah, and so, so it's it's so good. And I love that, you know, I love that you felt that that spiritual connection and that knowing. There's yeah. so much, there's so much we need to learn, isn't there? Mindy? Right. And that we don't know. And in and, and to your point, it's like when we have that agitation, we're creating resistance. And it doesn't matter who's watching us, but when we meet people, they're gonna match that energy and that resistance. And I think, you know, I have a son as well, but I feel like the mother daughter relationship is like, whoo, mama, like there's a lot. Four daughters. Oh, yes. God. Yeah, there's well, a I lot. am an expert in women's hormones. Right? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know what? I, I need to start sending a lot of the men that have been interviewing me have uh, three daughters and they are so interested in hormones. You need, I need to start sending them to you and be like, hey, go talk to Anna because not only is she a hormone expert, but she's got four <laughs> daughters. Um, so, but oh, you yeah. know- I've had a lot of practice. I've had a lot of practice. So yeah. good. But if you think about it just in general, I think we have to remember in our relationships around us, if they're not working right, sometimes they're matching our energy. Yeah. And we are the ones that are going to have to change our energy in order for them to see us differently. And that's really what I did with my daughter. I had a very strong opinion about what she should be doing in college, and she wasn't doing it. And I'm sure she felt that judgment. And the minute I got that inspiration on that third day water fast, I put down the judgment, which allowed her to come back and connect and make a, a better decision. So I think that happens for all of our relationships. Mm, yeah, no, I, and I agree. And holding that space, having that energy, putting yourself into a place of receptivity, I'm ready when she is. Yeah. And, and knowing that, but being able to trust number one, that your children are safe. And, you know, like, we, they have their own path, but what we can do to, 
know that they have a door open and you're a good mama. You're such a uh, good mama. So are you. Oh my gosh. So good. <laughs> yeah. So good. I mean, there's so much more I want to talk with you about. And there's so many, you know, we, gosh, we could just have a series, but we I think, I think this part, you know, like, you know, fasting, not fasting too much, too often, yes. really listening to your body. And then I have a question because I don't know if you can hear it. A little congested. Do you starve? A, do you feed a fever and starve a cold? Should you fast when you have the flu? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I, th I think I actually think feed a fever, starve a cold. I would say starve most everything. Um, and here's the research and the way that I've seen it is that, and this came out during, during the pandemic, was that what we saw was that when a virus comes into a cell, if it's a sugar burner sw cell swimming with tons of glucose, that virus will go in and gobble up that glucose and become stronger and start to replicate itself. Whereas if a virus comes into a cell that's in a state of autophagy, it literally shuts down and it cannot replicate. Viruses don't have their own energy system. They have to live off of yours. And so I actually tested this. I had COVID. Um, I think it was like fall of last year, 21. And um, I'm like, well, let me test it. So one day I fasted all day. I felt so much better. Next day I ate a really good diet. I felt horrible, but it was, you know, more carby. It was brought that glucose up. Next day I fasted. I felt better. So I played with the different pieces within five days, mostly, you know, I finally decided like, I'm just going to keep fasting with five days. I tested negative. My symptoms were gone. It was insane. Now my husband got it then after that. And didn't, he ate, he didn't fast as much and his lasted two weeks. Ah, so good. That is yep. good R and D. I'm telling you, that is good R and D. We had a question from Anne and she asked, um, and she's been told not to intermittent fast as diagnosed with vestibular migraine, trigger unknown, but may be affected by fasting. So yeah. um, what would you tell her? Yeah. You know what? Um, I'm seeing this in a couple of uh, people that I'm personally working with where they go into ketosis and they feel worse and they've been fasting for a long time. Um, and so what I've, if you go into the cell and you look at what ketones do to the mitochondria is that they upregulate glutathione. So the cell starts to pr produce more glutathione and push more toxins out. So the first thing I would say is you look at your toxic load because that cell is repairing and it's pushing toxins, which could be affecting the headaches. Um, again, we're back at this idea that, okay, let's fasting's not good, but fasting's telling you something in that scenario. So the first thing I would do is try to, to you could use some binders like an activated charcoal and see how that works. And if that kills the migraine, um, you could look at your toxic load. You could start doing some detoxes around your different fast. That would be amazing. Um, the other thing that I would I agree with that completely. I yeah, agree with yeah. that. That sounds like a toxic burden and an impaired detoxification pathway. So you need to support that pathway yeah. and as well use the binders. Yeah. And then the other thing I would throw in there is minerals, you know, make sure what, and aminos, what I've noticed in just fasting so many people is because of the, how poor our soils are. We, ha we don't get enough minerals in them. We don't have enough microbes. So try when you're fasting to do more of the, I, I'm a fan of the element stuff. I mean, there's a lot of great mineral stuff out there. I'm also becoming quickly a new fan of aminos um, because we're seeing it really change people's moods. Um, so we have in my community, I have people doing, um, minerals and aminos in their fasting window and fasting is getting a lot less symptomatic. Yeah. Especially early on. I think that's, and also yeah. with long time, long time fasters too, because you need those additional resources. I, I agree. Um, I'll often do mighty maca in the fasted window. Again, Perfect. that's supporting detoxification, Perfect. supporting phase one and phase two detoxification and supporting gut micro, the mi microbiome as well. Yep. So that's one thing. Um, I, I've done a trial of taking aminos either late at night or, or early in the morning to see. And that was very positive energy. So that was good. Yep. And of course, minerals during fasting. Now tell us about your book. Tell us where to find you and what yeah. the audience can do to catch up with you and get your book. 
so fast like a girl it's coming out at the end of december um and pre-orders are out now it, you know as as ann and i were talking about when when we first jumped on here pre-orders really matter um because it tells the booksellers that hey people want this book I am looking at this book, by the way, as a coming out party for women. It's going to be a way that we can start to have this discussion like you're hearing with Anna and I today. Um, we need to really start to understand our hormones and lifestyle. So, um, But you can find fastlikeagirl.com. We have a, a whole bunch of really fun giveaways. In fact, um, Anna, I should tell you about one fun one that I'm doing that I'll announce now. Um, I have pulled together Leanne Rhymes, Danica Patrick, and Elle McPherson to have a conversation about women's empowerment. And we're going to do that on December 20th for anybody who pre-orders the book. So you can attend that webinar. And I'm gonna, we're going to have these three badass women come and talk about you know, what it's been like to navigate women's mental and physical health with so many people it, it putting their projections on them and the, the world of fame, what it's done to their hormones. So these are three amazing women that are, have big hearts and are, are really authentic in, in how they talk. So that's a big, a big promo we're going to do in December, but fastlikeagirl.com is where oh you can. Oh my gosh, it. that is amazing. That is amazing. I definitely want the link to that and yes. share that with our community as well. Thank so you. be sure to send me all these links. We'll put them in the show notes. Thank and you. And you guys know where to find the recording at dranna.com forward slash show or on YouTube or anywhere you listen to podcasts. So um, big thank you to Dr. Mindy Pels oh, for being thank here. You. So thank you. awesome. All yeah. love our conversations. Agreed. I always learn something. <laughs> Agreed. Agreed. Like, I'm like you. That. Yeah, I'm like you. I could just talk to you all day. It's like, I just, I love your heart. I love how you think. So let's keep doing this more. This is, this was so fun. You guys, this is a great example of like-minded girlfriends getting together. That's right. So, That's right. uh, Thank you all for listening and being here today and please share this episode and definitely go check out Dr. Mindy Pels' book, Fast Like a Girl. So fastlikeagirl.com forward slash pre-order. We're in the pre-order phase and um, you can get it anywhere books are sold. So I am looking forward to continuing this conversation until next time, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.